Good evening and welcome. I'm here in the Celtic Junction Arts Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, and in the beautiful McKiernan Library. I'm joined tonight by my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Lynette Rainey Grandel. And we're going to have a conversation and then take questions, exploring why the great T.S. Eliot's masterpiece, uh, his great poem, the Wasteland still matters in its 100th year. I just want to um, remind anybody who's seen an earlier seminar we gave. Uh, we gave uh, a seminar on James Joyce's Ulysses on its birthday, February 2nd, earlier this year. So this is a mirror. Uh, 1922 was a high point year for literary history and literary experimentation. And it was a, it was a, a, a great moment uh, for uh, literary genius. Uh, so, Lynette, can I? <laughs> you've got a T.S. Eliot like cat in the background there. Um, yeah. Want to just uh, maybe say why the wasteland still matters in your view? Well, yeah, it it, it was um, incredibly influential when it was first published in 1922 it pretty much created high modernism in the literary arts, especially for poetry. Uh, and is and is still, I think, sort of the um, an exemplar of of um, modernist art. Um, and in that sense, it's still with us because we're still dealing with that 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 slump of what it feels like to move through a wasteland and how to put the pieces back together again. So in that sense, it's a poem um, that 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 is still relevant to people's psychological lives. I will say um, that I was really happy when you invited me to talk about this poem because I feel it's to some extent misunderstood because of the the the, the heavy academic intellectual references in the poem. But um, Patrick and I are gonna to argue tonight that you don't have to understand those references. It's, it's, it's a poem of mood. Um, and and um, yeah, it's fun to look at the references, but I don't think that you necessarily miss things if you don't know the references or you can't read Greek or French or German or Italian and all the other languages in the poem. Just a quick comment on Eliot's background. So he was born in 1888 in St. Louis, Missouri. So we're up in Minnesota where the Mississippi begins, but it it does uh, flow through uh, St. Louis. And he he the river and the river imagery is very important to him. Uh, his father was in his youth a type of artist, but he gave up art to become a businessman. He became a brick brick manufacturer and his mother wrote poetry and she kind of co-mingled her identity with the young uh thomas stern stern's the ts of his name is after his mother's maiden name um and that time in america is a time where there's a sort of a a diffuse quality to american identity uh elliot called himself a resident alien he felt that with the influx of immigrants, he felt that his Americanness was very uncertain. And this is one of the reasons why he ultimately leaves and lives in, in England. Do you want to comment a little bit on that sense of American identity being diffuse and somewhat fragmentary at that time? Well, I don't, I don't think it was so much fragmentary, but I would say that um, it's a time of developing jingoism. <laughs> um, it's the rise of big business. It's a time period of the robber barons. Um, it's a time of great concentration of American wealth. Um, it's, it's a time when there's a lot of boosterism going on. And I think that somebody um, working in the arts might've felt the falseness of that. And there's also the expectation that if Eliot stayed in the United States, he'd probably have to follow his father, uh, his father's footsteps and go into business, which is not what he wanted to do. 
So um, he's not the only person with this kind of story. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk about the expatriate movement right now, but this is a time period when um, as soon as they are finished with college and sometimes before that, um, you have a lot of American um, writers and artists of all types um, leaving America. You have uh, Gertrude Stein leaving America for Paris and so she can um, basically be herself, um, um, be in love with a woman. Uh, you know, you have F. F Scott Fitzgerald for quite a while um, is, is, um, has, has left the United States. Um, and, and certainly um, African-American writers were doing some of this too. So, so it, 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 it is a time of exploration. Um, the technology was available. The economics were available for um, Americans to go abroad and live abroad. And so many of them did to escape what I would say, uh, sort of the conventional expectations for their lives and, and maybe recreate themselves as artists to, to a bit as well. Right. And just one more quick question, the title, The Wasteland. So you've already referred to this kind of condition we're in today a little bit in the 21st century coming out of COVID slowly, but surely. <laughs> so that it's, it is a, it's an old archetypal mythic pattern that goes very deeply into human culture. Do you want to just comment on, on the significance of the title? Well, I know you're going to talk about um, the, the our Celtic and Arthurian legend uh, mythology connection to all of this. But, you know, the concept of a wasteland um, where, you know, there's drought, where nothing happens. I mean, the, I think this is a very old archetype. I think we even see this in the Old Testament. Um, and then, of course, as we're going to get into it, we're going to talk about Eliot having some personal um, uh, some, some situations with his personal life that feel rather like a wasteland. Um, and if you want to bring it to contemporary times, I mean, yeah, it's not just COVID, it's not just politics. Um, but the first thing I think of is you talk, you you ask me about the wasteland in contemporary times is what we're doing to the environment, you know. Uh, and 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 so I think the the concept here is still relevant. What can we do? We're sort of stuck in this thing. Um, and that is, to a great extent, what Eliot's poem is about. There's there's this sense of being trapped, of being stuck in this 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 um, morass that you know will not move on to the next stage, will not go through its death and rebirth cycle that we need to go through. Um, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself with that. Yeah, yeah. So the I'll just make a very brief comment because I will I will return to this sort of like a spiral staircase. So the wasteland obviously is deeply uh, involved in the Arturian tradition. And the Arturian tradition is widely accepted to have very deep Celtic roots, particularly in Wales. Arthur, if he was, he was while he wasn't the king, was some sort of a warrior warlord in Celtic Britain who resisted the influx of the Angles and the Saxons, probably in the sixth century. And then tales were told um, about his prowess over many, many centuries. So by the time we get the influx of the Breton storytellers coming through uh, the Nor following the Norman invasion, we get an influx into the French imagination of the Arturian as a romance genre. And then we get tales of the Grail and the Fisher King and the wounded Fisher King uh, presides over a wasteland. And the Celtic origins of, of that tale of the Grail and the Fisher King uh, Partly it's he's wounded by a spear, and therefore he's sort of maimed, therefore the land is desolate. So it's like the wounded psyche. And another ver other variance of the tale is he has a bad marriage. So an unfortunate emotional uh, conundrum can also create a wasteland in the, in the landscape. So we'll move on from just the opening remarks, and let's look at the sense, though, of Eliot to me, he's paradoxical. Um, now, he grew up Unitarian, and then he left Unitarianism to go on this big spiritual journey. He sort of explored a spiritual supermarket. Um, and one of the old jokes about the Unitarians is that um, they always use these terms, paradoxically, I feel, uh, 
as a Unitarian. So as a Unitarian and a former Unitarian, Eliot is very paradoxical. And so um, one of the most attractive traits in his poetry, when you read it, is the uniqueness of his voice, but just the sheer sense of, of play combined paradoxically with a sense of a kind of a tragic desolation, certainly in the wasteland. Um, and he, he is on a journey through his poetic life from desolation to trying to find redemption in a largely a Christian faith. After, several years after the wasteland, he converts to the Church of England and he pursues a, uh, a kind of a, a Christian philosophy of life. And that infuses his poetry, uh, particularly in the four quartets. But uh, I just want to get a sense of that, that he's play, so playful as a, uh, he is kind of like a big cat in his playfulness. Um, and so the wasteland is kind of discombobulating when you first read it, right? So it is this kind of feast of playful allusion and quotation. It's a lot of fun, right? It is a lot of fun. Um, and just to give a little bit of the sense of that kind of strange, unique kind of energy wave that kind of hits you when you first encounter Eliot. We're just going to do a little reading. So I'm going to just kind of blast out a little bit of the opening of from the very first section, The Burial of the Dead. Before April you start Sorry, reading, go ahead. Reading Patrick, so I just want to point out for our, our listeners that that so so you're starting with that kind of voice of doom. So that this is like there's so many voices. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and so you've got the voice of doom and then I'm going to come in with other another voice and you're going to come back with another voice and I'm going to come back with another voice. And that's that's the way the poem works. Right, so, right, right. There's a, this sense of there's a sense, again, of the paradox. There's a kind of a spiritual grief, but a deep playfulness in how he's he's using allusion, quotation, voice persona uh, to try and articulate this larger sense of cultural and personal wasteland. Uh, and it is a lot of fun in a paradoxical sense that it's kind of a tragic fun. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to sound, try and sound a little bit more uh, tragic when I read this these opening lines. So these are the famous opening lines of the poem. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in a forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us. Coming over the Starnberger Sea with a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade and we went on in sunlight into the Hoch Garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russen stamm aus Litauen, echt Deutsche. And when we were children staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. So right away there we get the sense of multiple voices, sort of a disorientation, an evocation of the world before World War I. So just, just briefly then, the tragic, chaotic historical frame is this is post-World War I, the great shattering of the youth of Europe uh, in the trenches and the great sense of trying to recover some sense of cultural unity. Eliot himself is trying, Eliot was deeply intellectual, deeply brilliant. He's trying to free himself from abstraction. Um, he's trying to free himself from being overly intellectual. And there's that sense of sound, sense of rhythm, the sense of incantation. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, you, you've got the, the, the ING sounds at the ends of those first lines. So they just sort of sing into each other. And then, and then suddenly there's this other little, it's almost like chickens, you know, conversational um, interruption. And then it goes back into this kind of flowing voice again. And, 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 and that is the emotion of the poem, I think. So one of the things he's doing, I think, is 
he's he's play, he's he's articulating the music of his of his own being deeper than intellectual conceptual rationality there's a sort of a there's a soulful incantation an auditory imagination a participation in the very flow the very river like flow of cultural energy in the poem um all right so this came up in one of our conversations when <laughs> I had a great question. She said, shall we have a little discussion about the ineffable? Um, so one of the things about the ineffable, the inexpressible uh, in spiritual expression, is that it does surface out of the ordinary, in particularly extraordinary cantation. So there's a, there's a sense of things surfacing. Again, this is very Arturian. The sword surfaces out of the lake. Um, so similarly, what surfaces out of words and Eliot is really trying to become a spiritual seeker. He's trying to find rebirth in his own personal wasteland, in the wasteland of post-World War I uh, Europe and America and the Western world. Um, and so that surfacing is what's rising up. And it's, it's, it's articulated in a way that is mysterious, incantatory, rhythmic, um, and that, that very force of auditory engagement is enchanting. Yeah, and 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 so when we say incantation, which literally means singing, right? Cant, chant. Mm -hmm. um, that we're, we're we're referring to the mood that you get into with the sound of the words, with the rhythm of the words. Um, it's been I'm doing this with my with my shoulders. It, it's it's been compared to. Um, uh the the way a dancer moves so you know then it gets in your body when you start to think about the rhythm of words as you know what kind of movements would your body do to these words um and so I, that is what Eliot is trying is doing to a large extent i think in this poem um that we sometimes completely miss because we're looking at the footnotes just try to figure out oh what's this a quote from what does that german mean um, the other thing I want to point out is that, Patrick, I think you've just picked the perfect illustration for this point, um, because the, the slide is showing um, these rays coming um, through the clouds onto the water, um, the sunlight coming down in rays. And of course, the only reason we can see that is because of the water vapor in the air. Um, and, and, and this is the, and, and that's one way that um, artists and I would say also um, um, spiritual practitioners try to, um, what should I say, try, try to represent the things that cannot be seen. So, you know, looking at cloud, you know, that's oftentimes uh, representing something that's there, that some, but you cannot see it. Or looking at fog, at steam, at smoke, all of these kinds of things. If you think back to um, all of the stories about some kind of spiritual experience, I mean, I would say even, you know, church incense is another way of doing it. It's the scent, but it, there's a little bit of smoke in the air as well. So, so I mean, it's... Eliot's poetry artistically is drawing upon those kinds of things to try to create the 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 mood, um, the sense um, that something is wrong, that something is lost, um, and and that he's searching about for it. And then there are all these fragmentary pieces, and the fragments, of course, come back at the end as well. Would Would you agree that? To me, he's he's a spiritual seeker. This is a poem that's full of a deeply articulated spiritual longing and yeah. torment almost. Um, and and yes, there is a sense of desolation, but there is a longing for to surface, as you're saying, this to surface some sort of ineffable spiritual rebirth or the the scent of the Holy Ghost. There's some sense of a a uh, a redemption from just broken mortality yeah there's a longing but there's also an incredible sense of failure um which i think we'll get to pretty soon um this this sense that you know he had the the, the speaker the figure whoever this is in the poem and it, this multi-personed speaker in the poem um has failed to rise to the challenge to the occasion 
um, to actually set upon the path and get somewhere with it. Okay. So just very briefly, the chronology, um, born, in, as I said earlier, in 1888 uh, in St. Louis. Uh, he, he longed to get away, though, from the Midwest. Uh, he went to Harvard. He was a brilliant student of both, both academic philosophy and poetry. For a while, he thought he would become an academic philosopher. Um, he fell in love. Crucially, there are two women in his biography that are kind of uh, central to the, um, the, the disruption of his, uh, of his sort of psyche. Um, he falls in love with an American uh, called Emily Hale. She pops up in the poem as the hyacinth girl, and there's several reference to her, references to her. And over the course of his life, he will write at least 1,100 letters to her. Um, in England, though, he marries an English woman called Vivian Highwood, pictured here. Um, and it is a very fraught and unhappy marriage. Um, and Eliot did say, to me, the marriage brought the state of mind out of which came the wasteland. And again, there is that um, ironic mythic parallel in some Celtic stories that a misalliance, um, unfortunate marriage, can lead to the desolation and aridity of the landscape. So that does echo. And so now Vivian High Wood is a very interesting um, person. So perhaps, um, Lynette, do you want to comment on the condition for women at this time? Yeah, yeah. Well, there are a couple of things going on here. Um, um, and, and I think for the purposes of, of tonight's discussion, let's just put the blame on both sides <laughs> in the marriage. Um, yeah, I, I, she she was somebody who, she herself, I think, was the, the daughter of, a, of artists. And they met um, is it in Oxford? I think Oxford or Cambridge. Now I'm confusing the two. Uh, and and she was working, I believe, as a nanny somewhere or governess or something like that. Um, and but they were but she, she was she was very interesting to him. She she apparently came across like an actress. She 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 smoked in public. She dressed in interesting clothes. She spoke her mind. Um, uh, she 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 was somebody very much unlike him, um, and and apparently he wanted to have a relationship with her, but not necessarily get married. But he wanted to stay in England, and so Ezra Pound convinced the both of them that they should get married. So if we can blame this maybe on Ezra Pound. Um, so what was wrong with their marriage? Both of them had some pretty serious um, problems with their health. Um, um, Vivian had had poor health since childhood. I think she had uh, uh, tuberculosis of the arm, which I'm not even sure what that is, but tuberculosis of the arm from the time she was a child, all kinds of things. Her mother didn't think that she was um, physically suited to be married. Uh, and and um, uh, T. S. Eliot himself was was born with a congenital double hernia and seems to have been very careful about his own physical health. Um, and then I think that they both um, wanted different lives for themselves. That you know maybe maybe if there had been more money in the relationship, it would have gone a little more smoothly. But both of them had um, nervous problems, shall we say. Um, history has not treated Vivian very well, um, but I would like to say that she probably was a very frustrated person. Um, if you look at the, the, you know, if you consider the role of women back in 1915, um, she, she was, I don't know, I would say maybe upper middle class, but not as high class as T.S. Eliot's friends that he was hanging around with. And they looked down on her and she was quite aware of that. Um, the other thing I would say is that women don't even get the vote until 1928. So, I mean, she is, she's not seen as a complete person. She's not seen as a person who can have complete rights. Um, and then when you talk about um, Emily Hale, I think we can talk a little bit more about expectations for women as well. Um, there we go, <laughs> unattainable muse. 
um yeah and, and so so um i think a emily hale perhaps got idealized in Eliot's mind um whereas vivian was an actual flesh and blood woman with let's just say a lot of messy health problems that he had to deal with in person so and 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 you know not not that you know um uh, angel of the house on a pedestal or anything like that. Um, probably not someone who knew her place. So they, they, they he ended up separating from her and then eventually her brother um, institutionalized her and she died. Um, and so so unpleasant for both of them. Yeah, earlier you had that quote about um, the marriage bringing, uh, putting Elliot in the state of mind out of which came the wasteland. But the first part of his statement actually is that to her, the marriage brought no happiness. Mm -hmm. So he did acknowledge that she was not happy with their relationship either. So um, now life is not the same as art. Um, and it did inspire a very interesting tension in the poem. So um, mm -hmm. maybe we can talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, so um, we have to talk about the hyacinth girl part. Yeah, we will. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the hyacinth girl part, this is still in um, the, bur the burial of the dead, I believe. Yes. Um, and this is this is the reference. You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Yet when we came back late, from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet. I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, the silence. And so that to me is, so she, she is in America while he's in England, married, trying to make the marriage work, and it's disintegrating uh, for both of them. So there's that sense of, again, a longing for somebody and something that's unattainable. Um, and this kind of fits into this whole mood we call now modernism and high modernism. And the crucial year is 1922. Um, so the gentleman with the askance eye in the top picture there is the great a mischievous trickster figure and Ezra Pound, and he kind of defines the modern in the arts, particularly the literary arts, as the shock of the new. Um, Thomas Stearns Eliot very much studied also the great Irish novelist James Joyce, and he credited Joyce with what he called the mythic method, uh, saying that Joyce's Ulysses, which had, was published in a full novel form earlier in the year in 1922, um, provided a model for the contemporary writer, because what Joyce was doing in Ulysses was using mythology, uh, the Greek um, parallels in the Odyssey, where Leopold Bloom became a reincarnated uh, version of Odysseus, Stephen Dedalus was a, a reincarnated version of Telemachus, and then, of course, Molly Bloom is Penelope reimagined in Dublin in 1904. And so that scaffolding of the Greek mythic uh, structure allowed Joyce to play with all kinds of ironic reverberations in the modern. So for Eliot, he's using the Arturian in part. He's using a lot of other things. He's also using Dante. He's using Sanskrit. He's using the Upanishads. He's using Buddhism. But he's using a whole variety of ways to create a mythic echoes with this sense of desolation that is the modern condition. Um, so you want to perhaps say a little about the great uh, <laughs> trickster that is Ezra Pound? Ezra Pound, yeah, I love the photo you've chosen of him. Um, I like to think of him as the P.T. Barnum of modernism. Uh, he truly um, brought out people's careers, connected them with each other. Um, he, of course, was a poet himself, another one of these expatriates. He ended up in Italy. Um, but he is also, uh, I don't know if you could call him the founder of imagism, which was essentially the poetry movement that he was pushing at this time, starting around 1913. Um, and uh, he, he, he had three rules for imagism. So remember, you know, we've been coming out of Victorian poetry, we've been coming out of rhyme, rhythm, that sort of thing. Um, the kind of thing that you maybe you still think is poetry, and it is poetry, but 
in in the in the twentieth century, it was considered too old fashioned, and they were making a break from that. Um, sort of, it's analogous to what Cubism did to representational painting. So, so um, Pound's rules for imagism were direct treatment of the subject. In other words, no extra little flourishes. Um, it's a rather plain speech. Use no word that does not contribute to the presentation. So again, you know, don't add in filler words. Um, in in creative writing today, we call these service words that you can take out, um, and and also use no. Uh, let's see. Um, compose in the rhythm of the musical phrase not in the rhythm of the metronome. So this is where free verse really gets going. And that still influences us greatly to this day. Yeah, and Pound took the very much larger version that was the Wasteland and, and sort of, he helped kind of prune it into this sort of a much, much more uh, intense evocation of the music of Eliot's being. So let's let's just keep going to where we can Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Let's look a little bit more closely then. Um, we were just kind of discussing some of the backgrounds of modernism and the great kind of uh, network of which Eliot was part uh, with Joyce and Ezra Pound and his troubled marriage and his longing for the hyacinth girl. So the wasteland, it's divided up into five sections and they echo and repeat motifs. And basically, again, sterility, and spiritual longing, that kind of paradoxical fusion um, within the mythic pattern of vegetation and fertility symbolism from a variety of cultures and literatures. And so the five sections then are the burial of the dead. Let's look at that to begin with. Game of chess, fire, the fire sermon, death by water, what the thunder said. And we'll just go through each one of these sections very briefly and, and comment on, the, on them. So the burial of the dead is, um, we, we read the beginning, April is the cruelest month. Uh, it's it's again using Joyce's mythic method, so scaffolding of myth. Uh, a very famous book from, published in 1920 uh, was drawn on by Eliot called Ritual to Romance, and it's sort of reimagining the Grail legend as a kind of a pagan cult ritual. Um, the poem is very multivocal. We've already mentioned the the, high, the hyacinth girl, and again, the Fisher King figure emerges, surfaces through this Grail tradition, and the Grail tradition again uh, comes out of a Celtic sense of an otherworldly cauldron that then gets translated from a cup of plenty into a platter of plenty, and then that moves across from the Celtic regions into the French literary courts. And then we get the, the great French poet, Cretchen de Troy, writes his, his uh, prose romance, uh, Ar the Arturian romance, Percival. But unfortunately, Cretchen dies before he finishes. That's the story of seeking the grail from the Fisher King. Uh, and then there are all these continuators who come along. And the greatest continuator is the German uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach in the early 13th century. And then he, he calls his Percival, he calls him Parzival. Um, and he has a much more elaborated sense of the wounded Fisher King. And echoes of Parzival resound through the poem, as well as references to the Fisher King, woundedness, desolation in the landscape, um, quotations from Wagner, the great German composer, um, and other references to this, this seeking for some spiritual unity in a sense of a shattered landscape. So the picture we have here is, is of course, Dante. And Dante is a kind of a model for Eliot ultimately in his whole, in his entire biography is to try and find a divine comedy, not just be arrested in this, in this sort of tormented state of the inferno, the purgatorio, the modern, the modern world, but find some kind of redemptive, redemptive uh, vision. And so, uh, so it's kind of a sense of frustration. Okay, so let's just keep going. Game of chess. So do you want to say, you want to start talking about it or do you want me to say more about this? I yeah, mean, it's a mar mm -hmm. marriage, right? Um, they're, they're in a game of chess, we have different relationships. Um, they're all terrible. Um, <laughs> um, as we were preparing for this, um, 
we realize there's a lot of bad sex in this poem. And by bad sex, I mean um, sex without spiritual connection. You know, that's that's the emptiness that that he's experiencing. I mean, that's sorry, let me back up from that. Let's not conflate Eliot the writer with this the sense of the poem. But but certainly, you know, we we can tell there's some negativity going on um, in his in his personal life. Um, and he's able to draw on that to bring that feeling into the poem and then concoct these examples. Um, it, it, it's, it's really, there's a sense that it's soulless and, and that is a wasteland experience. Um, the other thing I'll mention here is that, that there's, this is sort of the crisis point that modernism deals with. And when I say modernism, I, I want to make sure that I, you know, I'm referring to pretty much the first half of the 20th century. Um, and, and there is this sense that that there was all this promise that the new century would give us, and then everything just completely disappointed, and we ended up having a world war instead. Uh, and 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 so I think that there's this there's this malaise: what to do with the pieces, how to how to how to pick up these fragments, and. Um, but 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 it, what's interesting about Eliot's poem is that he doesn't know how to reconstruct the, that that world with the pieces that are left. He's trying to, and so that's the tension of the poem, I think. Yeah, and I just want to um, point out to anybody watching: if you have a question or a comment, uh, please post it in the Q and A, and we will, um, in about ten or minutes or so. Um, we will try and pause to take some questions and comments and, you know, give some uh, further elaboration. So, yeah, we get this, we get this sense of disintegration, fragmentation. Um, and then the third section is called the fire sermon. Now, there was a whole sense of discovering the East, this, this sense of Asian culture being explored, Buddhism. Uh, Eliot did study Sanskrit. He studied French, he studied German, and there are quotations from French. He studied Italian, but he also did study Sanskrit. And so there was this search for Buddhist and Hindu wisdom to redeem a kind of a fossilized, desiccated Western Europe. And so the Buddhist fire sermon is sort of a, a warning about the perils of lust and greed and uh, the inner fire. Um, uh, Eliot quotes, quotes uh, in the poem, he says, while I was fishing in the dull canal. So he's very much identifying the protagonist of the poem with the Fisher King, this wounded guardian of the grail who seems to be removed from the grail's um, benign influence, that sense of meaning and unity. He's in a kind of a fragmented modern condition. And again, he's referencing Parzival. He's referencing Tiresias from the Greek um, mythic uh, frame. And then he's referencing characters in history like Queen Elizabeth and uh, what the gentleman who's sometimes called her secret husband, the Earl of Leicester, and the sense of lust, bad sex, poor relationships, soullessness, and then St. Augustine coming to Carthage, burning with lust and, and a sense of just a sense of malaise, sense of looking for some larger redeeming vision. And of course, this is very modern to the time, and it's still in our culture, this seeking wisdom through meditation, through Buddhism. Um, the British poet Stephen Spender uh, contended that Eliot was actually contemplating whether he should become a Buddhist during the period he was composing this poem. So it is kind of interesting. Patrick, do you want to say anything about the influence of theosophy? Yeah, so on Yes, sure. Part of this part of this cultural moment is Madame Blavatsky. She's one of the great repackagers of Buddhism and Hinduism, and she's she's articulating a, a myth, a mythic story of spiritual evolution, which largely gives rise to what we today would call the New Age movement. So that sense of almost like the spiritual supermarket is opening up, and Eliot is kind of like a seeker. Should he become a Buddhist? Can he find wisdom in the Arturian, the Fisher King legends? Can he find it in other kinds of literary expression? So he's sort of this Parzival figure looking for the grail while also being this wounded Fisher King. Uh, 
in the desolation of the disintegrating marriage. So it's a, he's playing across multiple strands of illusion and cultural expression. And he, he does reference that moment in Western culture where, where we were starting to try to find ways to open up new spiritual paths. All right, let me just keep going. Yeah. And then we get death by water. Do you want to comment on this, please, Lynette? Well, yeah, so, so we've been talking about the wasteland where nothing grows. Um, it's usually very dry. Um, sometimes there are rats crawling through it, that, that whole thing. Um, but then we have too much water. <laughs> and, and this is a familiar theme in Eliot's work. If you've read um, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, you'll remember the famous ending, um, Till the Mermaids Hear Us. And the, uh, till we hear the mermaids singing, and then we drown, um, and 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 so there's this sense that you know well, he's afraid, really. Um, the speaker, the 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 persona in the poem is is afraid to go too far into this because you know to go too far into life means to go too far into a situation where you might drown in it, you might be completely obliterated by it. Phlebas the Phoenician is kind of an interesting character. It's a really short section of the poem, maybe half a page long. And, 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 and the Phoenicians, remember, are great traders. So he's a merchant, not a spiritual person. Um, and you get the sense that he's fallen overboard and he's getting sucked into a whirlpool, um, which, which could be read as, you know, going through the cycle and maybe you'll come out and be reborn again. But I don't think Phlebas feels that way about it. I think, I think Phlebas is experiencing death. Um, and, 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 and so th there's an ominous sense here. You know, this is what can happen um, if, you, if you step into the waters of life too much. Yeah, there's also a sense, though, that a purely materialistic worldview, in, in some sense, kind of misses the point of of the ineffable mystery that Elliot is contending with. And of course, Elliot did work in banks and it did work in the stock exchange at various points in his career. So he had that Phlebas the Phoenician side of his personality. And of course, his father was a very successful businessman, but it's the material uh, is insufficient for what he's seeking. All right, so then let's look at the last section. This is kind of where all the threads uh, the illusions, the symbolism, the spiritual longing, um, the Arturian context, uh, they all kind of flow into this sort of not quite fully conclusive, maybe perhaps fully inconclusive in that, in that paradoxical, playful manner that Eliot had. And this is what the thunder said. So uh, there's a sense in which the, the, Eliot's Unitarianism uh, he found as a young man was very abstract. It didn't really have a sense of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So in part, what he's seeking it as he becomes later, about five, six years after composing this poem uh, in 1922 and having, having it published, he does become what he calls an Anglo-Catholic. So he does join the Anglican um, faith, Church of England. Um, so there is a reference to Jesus as a kind of a vision, the journey to a mouse. Um, and there's also then a, a reference in the opening section here of approaching the, the Grail Castle, the chapel, uh, Perilous. And the question is asked, and again, partly this is a reference to an Antarctic expedition. It may be an hallucination. Is Jesus present? Again, the spiritual questioning, is it an hallucination? When the explorers are in the Antarctic, are they seeing somebody next to them when they're walking? Um, so the question is asked in the poem, who is the third who walks beside you? And then we're kind of we're kind of coming to some kind of crescendo, um, the aridity, the desert-like desolation. We get references to a damp gust bringing rain. Um, Eliot's voice says, "I sat upon the shore fishing with the plain behind me." Um, there's this great line: "These fragments I have shored against my ruins, the fragments of illusion and symbol and reference and disintegration through the poem." And then it ends with this great incantation, maybe hopeful. It's kind of, it's wonderfully um, Dante-like uh, from Sanskrit, shanti, 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 usually translated as meaning the peace 
that pass it uh, understanding. And so there's a sense that not that he's resolved everything, but perhaps a phase of hope is opening up in his wasteland, that some kind of spiritual uh, seed has been sown, right? And remember, in the rest of his career, he does become more confident of, perhaps confidence is not the right word, more centered in a, a life of faith rather than a life of disintegration, right? Yeah, and I'll I'll just add to this that that I think that that what makes the the poem really important is that he is able to maintain the tension between the these two opposite possibilities. You know, um, we have thunder, you know, kind of in the distance speaking. It's um, every once in a while, every few lines in the poem, um, you know, and so the thunder suggests that rain will come except there are plenty of times when thunder speaks and no rain <laughs> comes, you know? Um, and, and, and the Shanti, 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 I think is so interesting because it could be interpreted as sort of like the words you say to comfort yourself, you know, in hopes that you will have the peace of under the passes understanding, but not necessarily that you have achieved it yet you're you know you're you're going through the motions you're putting a smile on your face because someone told you you'd feel better if you did that you know um and so so it, it's interesting yeah i sat upon the shore fishing with the plane behind me that's the fisher king you know will he catch something will he achieve what needs to be done um to bring the lands back in order we we don't know and um the persona of the poem doesn't know either. Yeah, it's very interesting that that it's the the poem's title is kind of like an answer to a question. And so in the Grail legends, Parzival, who's the knight, Percival, the French call him, the Germans call him Parzival. Uh, Parzival, in questing for the Grail, comes to the castle of the Fisher King. And as the dazzling Grail is presented, uh, the point, the point of the of that moment in the Grail legend is for Parzival to ask, "What is what ails you, Uncle?" As he sees the wounded Fisher King, but because he's dazzled by the Grail, he fails to answer. So then he has to go off again. The castle disappears. He has to go back off in his quest. So it's a quest for actual psychological maturity of a growth into compassion and insight, right? Which is difficult, right? Um, in when you're when you're wandering through a wasteland so um when parcival does answer uh does ask the question he then can trans can move to becoming the fisher king so that whole sense of questing to gain the wisdom to then be guarding the grail so there is that sense uh there is that sense of tension can a question be answered what is the thunder saying? Uh, I always think about modernism. Ezra Pound said it's the shock of the new. I always think it's also the shock of the old. We have to go into these wells of archetypes and mythic patterns to re, re, reboot and, and create, recreate anew the culture. We seem to have lost our way. Again, it's Dante is being lost in the dark wood, the opening of the inferno. So we're, we're always having to kind of go back deep down and it's kind of it's 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 an extraordinary end of, to the poem, uh, extraordinary galvanizing and sort of strangely, paradoxically inspirational and frustrating and and just deep with all kinds of potential uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, just to kind of wrap it up, and then we'll we'll be open to to some concluding comments and look at the uh, Q and A. So again, if you have any question or comments you want to please post it in the q a um and i'll get to it in just a moment so um so what is the enduring stature of t.s Eliot? so a hundred years a poem that is usually considered uh one of the greatest um harold bloom um back in the 1980s he he, he called it as the greatest of the 20th century so it was difficult to say what's the greatest and what's not the greatest um Eliot's later career um, is more conservative to some critics, certainly critics coming out of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, he dies, Eliot dies in 1965. So um, 
to me, he's he's the great eminence. He's the great, I mean, Seamus Heaney, the Irish poet studying Eliot in the 1950s as a schoolboy, described Eliot as the way, the truth, and the life. And so Eliot, Eliot is certainly one of the greatest uh, poets, British and American of the 20th century. Um, to my mind, that sense of spiritual longing and seeking makes him incredibly relevant. Um, in the Arturian, the reason the Arturian still speaks to us is the Arturian rose up as a, at a point of chaos. The Roman Empire pulled out of Britain. The, the remaining Celtic Britons were uh, finding their lands overrun by invading Germanic hordes uh, over the next century or so. And so out of that moment of chaos surfaces the figure of the warrior who champions defending his land, right? And we get that in our headlines today. That's Zelensky in, your, in the Ukraine. That's the Arturian archetype. So at a time of chaos, out surfaces this figure. Um, the Arturian then is also complemented by the Grail legends that the knights around Arthur need to find a meaning larger than just military conquest. And so then, so it opens up this space of spiritual individual questing, right? And again, that leads to a wounding, the Fisher King, how do you cope with being psychologically wounded? Can you still be compassionate? Can Parzival turn into the Fisher King? Can the fishing of the Fisher King lead to spiritual redemption and unification? So for Eliot, the answer was organized religion, particularly the Christian path. Um, he did he did push his trolley through a supermarket of spiritual options. Um, but to me, that's that's kind of what I see in him, a deeply playful, uh, bittersweet, kind of tragic fun at human creativity, allowing us to seek again, renew the quest. All of us will be in wastelands. The, way, the wasteland is unavoidable. Chaos is always surfacing. But out of the surfacing of the, of the wasteland can come the seeking for the grail, seeking to recognize the woundedness of your own inner Fisher King, and trying to find some, some peace. I would agree. Do we have any questions? Yes, let's look at the Q&A. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start with the Q&A. Uh, okay, we're referencing the, the Arturian tradition. Arthur, Ar Arthur, King Arthur. Arthur. Yeah, so the Arturian tradition, um, sorry, I know it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to sum up an entire literary uh, tradition that's over, over several hundred years. Um, the Arturian tradition, uh, one of its subsets is the, is the tradition of the Fisher King. And the Fisher King is a wounded king who guards the Grail, the Holy Grail, and his woundedness causes the land to be desolate, to be a wasteland. So, so T.S. Eliot in the poem is taking that image from the Arturian and, and layering it with all kinds of contemporary personal references and references to the society in post-World War uh, one Europe and America, that, that 1920s sense of some crisis of meaning. Okay. Um, you want to say anything? Um, well, yeah, yeah. So I, I think the question was really about your pronunciation of Arthurian. But <laughs> um, anyway, yes, um, Arthurian as in King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, um, which, which, you know, I think in 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 the twentieth century, sometimes you know, through popular culture, gets conveyed um, just with the individual knights and all the romance of that. Um, but but obviously, it goes much deeper than that. Um, and and back to the the stature of T. S. Eliot, um, I do think that that we're talking about T. S. Eliot tonight because of the wasteland, because he captured very well that, um, if not perfectly, very well that sense of malaise, of not knowing what to do, which, as you rightly said, is something we all experience. Everybody goes through a wasteland. Um, and back when we were um, talking about the Hyacinth Girl section, you know, where we've got this lush, lush section where there's this beautiful girl and she's got the flowers and her hair is wet. It's so romantic. <clears throat> 
and the speaker says, I, my eyes failed, you know, I couldn't do anything, you know, that, that is where he, you know, if, if you follow Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, that is where he has failed to answer the call, call to adventure. And, and, and therefore we do get the wasteland because he hasn't said yes. He hasn't, he hasn't been like Molly Bloom at all. <laughs> you know? um, and, 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 and so, so he's not, they're, he's not yet able to become the hero in this situation. Um, it doesn't mean that he can't. And so that's where we're poised um, at the end of the poem. Very good. Um, I've got a question perfectly in harmony with that commentary, uh, Lynette, if you don't mind. So I'll just read it to you. So Ryan asks, could you discuss more the idea of the psychological wasteland and how the modern individual can partake in the archetypal hero's journey? Do we need to create our own personal myth journey to create meaning in light of this psychological wasteland? Do you want to start with that? And then I'll jump in if you don't mind. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what I can say about that. Um, I, I don't know if I would say create our personal myth, though, you know, maybe, maybe that is the way to put it. Um, as a writer uh, who, who needs to create narrative arcs out of things myself, um, I know that we do need to, when, when, when we're taking things that occur in life and we're trying to put them in some kind of narrative, some kind of story that we tell ourselves, and we do tell ourselves stories about our lives, um, you do need to put it into terms of, you know, what was the high point? What was the low point? What was it that set me on this path? So, um, yeah, maybe we we are creating our own personal myth. I, I would say our own personal journey um, or recognizing the stages of our own personal journey is maybe a better way of putting it. Um, I think we all know what it feels like to be in the wasteland. Um, but then how, how, do, how do we get out of the wasteland? There's the question and, and maybe going back to, you know, was there a call? Should I be paying more attention to the to the bird that calls me, you know, to follow, um, you know, up this path and, you know, or, or, you know, going through the closet and then discovering you're in the lantern wasteland in Narnia, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, you know, when, when something presents itself following that, um, I think that maybe when we start to recognize those landmark stages in our own personal journeys, that's how we can start to make sense of it. Yeah, I, I'm very well said. I just would say, um, I kind of want to say yes. <laughs> so to the question. Um, so Joseph Campbell is, is usually credited with the hero's journey, his book uh, from 1949, The Hero at a Thousand Faces. So Campbell, as a young man, was in Paris. Campbell was born in 1904. So he was in Paris in the 1920s, late 1920s, about 1928 or so. And so he felt the shock of the new when he discovered James Joyce's Ulysses and Shakespeare and Company in the heart of Paris. And that kind of, and he was an Arturian I got to be careful how I say it, Arturian scholar of medieval romance of, of the French and German tradition. Um, and so uh, Joyce shocked him and Eliot too had an impact on him in, in opening up the Arturian to this larger sense of the mythology of the world and the hero's path. So I would say the, the reason the Arturian speaks to us again today is again, it's a, it's a myth of responding to chaos. And so chaos keeps rising up in our culture. Now, it's interesting in literary history that up to the 15th century, there was intense um, writing of Arturian romances. And then in the 15th century, as we start moving into the Renaissance period, uh, there's much more humanistic literature. But the Arturian comes back in British literature in, with Tennyson in the 19th century. And then Eliot here, as a transplanted American, is drawing on these archetypal images from the Grail legends, uh, again, coming from the medieval German, 
to articulate his own sense of psychological woundedness. The, the, I mean, the Fisher King is a wounded figure. And so from that, the Eliot of the great, the great poetry is surfacing, is rising up out of that ineffable wound. So I, I would say, yes, um, it's a strange argument, but the wounds you carry are the way to unfold your quest for the grail in your life. They may be unpleasant, but those points of darkness and desolation, they're what give us one of the greatest poems of the 20th century, usually considered the greatest, but it's hard to say what the greatest is, this this masterpiece by Eliot. Um, so yeah. yes, own myth. <laughs> um, and then I've got one more question here by Crystal. You want to take this one, Lynette, again? Do you think Eliot knew the end as he began writing The Wastelander, or was it an exercise in discovery for him? Excellent question. Yeah, I mean, it 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 has to be, I think, pretty much speculation, um, though it seems unlikely he would have known the end, um, just because most writing doesn't work that way. Um, unless you're John Irving. <laughs> John Irving is famous for writing the last sentence um, and, the, and, and then putting it in an envelope and giving it to a friend and then, you know, writing his way to that. But but most writers aren't like that. I, I think that that um, for Eliot, this was certainly um, something of self-discovery. We should mention he wrote it when he was um, in a sanitarium in Switzerland, um, and it was many pages long. Um, there was a lot more to it, and then he handed it over to Ezra Pound, and Pound started crossing things out and you know um and 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 compressing it quite a bit um and so um as i look at the, the it, i think in the 1970s they published what's known as the facsimile edition of it and you can see some of those cross marks and changes um but but i don't think that um it it was in a different order i think that this was generally the order that Eliot sent it to pound in and um you know one of the things we didn't talk about is how it's in five sections which might be analogous to a tragedy in five acts um and 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 there there is a sense of the um dramatic and, you know, in that we have the opening part, um, you know, burial of the dead, you know, let's come to the service, right, for the funeral. Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then we have these other scenes. And, you know, the thunder, I don't think the thunder could have come earlier. Um, I think it has to come at the end because it's, it's that, you know, it's that crescendo building and we don't know where where the crescendo will, will end yeah the the uh i think the 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 discovery process for Eliot is to ultimately become committed to a christian path now he's criticized later in his career for that seeming to be a culturally conservative path that he was on later in his career but it, he, it kind of depends which kind of critic you are. Um, Eliot would regard it as the fulfillment of these spiritual questions. Uh, and so his later, his later writing, particularly the four quartets, are either the culminating uh, masterpiece of his entire uh, canon of work, or they are a kind of a repackaging of, of uh, Christian um, orthodoxy. Um, I think myself that... Uh, and I, I, I acknowledge my my colleague Matt Doyle and I, who taught a, a class in the spiritual journey of T.S. Eliot. I, I think that for Eliot, that ultimate spiritual journey is is where he's trying to go. The the wasteland is a kind of a a transitional phase of confusion. Um, he's reputed to call it rhythmic grumbling. And <laughs> he's, he's, he's older. You know. Yeah, go well, ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, but 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 of course, it makes for better art, you know. There's there's a reason why we're captivated by the wasteland. The four quartets, you know, are beautiful, but they 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 don't captivate in the same way. They're written from a per perspective of somebody who thinks he's arrived at at some knowledge, and that doesn't usually make for good art. It's it's a continuing source of a of a pendulum 
and a debate about the wasteland and the four quartets. And I think, again, it's one of those tensions in the living, uh, the living legacy of the great uh, T.S. Eliot. So um, I think it's, it's a good point to, to end, uh, unless there's any further, um, any further comments. Matt has put in a yes. Thank you, Matt. Um, the Holy Spirit has finally moved you to say something. <laughs> um, uh, so I'd like to very much thank my, uh, my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Uh, Lynette, uh, Rainey Grandel. Um, I'm coming to you from the McKiernan Library here at Celtic Junction Arts Center, and this is one of our education seminars. We, we've been tracking these 100 anniversaries, so <laughs> we'll see what we come up with next as we move into 2023. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. It's been uh, really great, and um, we hope to see you again at another one of these seminars. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Lynette.